I'm Max. I'll be the garden coach today. And today we're going over having a good lawn, uh, taking care of weeds and uh, any pest problems. But uh, the main way to uh, retrieve a great yard or lawn is primarily, you know, have good maintenance practices to uh, develop a vigorous turf. That's the best weed defense. You can still have some weeds, but there'll be few and far between if the turf is really vigorous. How we achieve that? Well, several things you're going to be doing to make a, the grass work. Fertilize it, water it, mow it, take care of weeds. And of course, uh, here, water is one of the big things. And you want to water in a way that you get an adequate amount of water and you get adequate penetration. And the way you do that, you've got an amount that you're going to apply and it changes with the seasons, not surprisingly. So in the winter, you're wanting to achieve one to two inches equivalent of rainfall per month. And this is including rainfall. So your watering responsibilities in the winter are not great. Uh, then in spring and fall, you're going to want uh, one to two inches every couple weeks. And then in the summer, in, uh, which you know, you're looking at depending on how the summer goes, May, June, July, August, September, October is transitional. But uh, in the really hot months, it's uh, one to two inches per week. And the key thing about that is uh, how do you know when that's happened? Well, if you haven't explored it, you won't know. So if you eat tuna, keep the cans. If not, some kind of cans, little containers, and you spread them around run your sprinkler system, time it, something like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, then you see how much you have in your cans. Clever. But if you haven't measured your watering, you don't know. So, and of course, uh, the other things to know about it is, uh, once you know how fast your sprinkler puts out the water, the next thing you need to know is how much water you can apply before it just starts to run off. So you can, if it, if it takes, just for for instance, it takes 10 minutes before it starts to run off, and it takes 20 minutes to put down an inch. These are just numbers out of the air, but so your initial running of the sprinkler system should be at 10 minutes. Starts to run off, you stop. And uh, best to do this early in the morning and wait an uh, hour or two, and then do your second 10 minutes, and that would give you an inch. And this, the second watering chases the first watering further down into the soil. And uh, also the reason for the morning is uh, you could do it at 5 in the morning and then at 7 and or 6 and then at 7 or 8. But the key thing there is, is that it doesn't help to keep grass wet, the foliage wet. If a leaf is wet for six hours, that's enough for a fungus spore to, to take hold. So if it's not wet for six hours, you take care of that. You're not encouraging fungus. So if you do it early in the morning, you know, five, six, seven, uh, the sun comes up. Typically, the wind comes up. The foliage is dry, and that takes care of that. Fertilizing, typically, you're going to do that. Uh, first one will be sometime in March. Depending on, depending on how the weather goes. You, you want to be fertilizing once your grass has come out of dormancy. And who knows about the winter? You know, sometimes it's canceled. So the grass may be coming on early March. If it's more of a winter and it's not coming on until later, it could be later March for that first uh, fertilizing. And uh, well, if the weather continues like this, it'll be early to mid-March. Uh, I mean, we're going to be 90 on Monday. So that encourages. And, and of course, we're, we're, having, uh, we're having relatively warm nights, you know, and that, that's the big thing. Once the nights stay warm, things get underway. Uh, the next fertilizing would be May. And then uh, the last one that I'd go for would be uh, September. And mowing, uh, the one-third rule applies. And that is, when you mow, you don't want to take off more than one third of the uh, grass blades. And typically on St. Augustine, you're going to be maintaining like a two inch height to the grass. So that means 
when it gets three inches tall, it's time to mow. If it's four inches tall, you're cutting half of it off, you know, not a third. So, and you might ask, could I mow too often? Uh, I don't know that it's ever happened, but because it's not something people tend to do and do. But uh, typically, uh, when the grass is really going, it could it could stand mowing every four or five days, you know. And the the key thing to remember is, and you may not know this, but turf grasses they like to be mowed. Weeds don't like being mowed. Uh, it stresses them out because they grow higher, and when you cut a bunch of them off, they're stressed. When you cut grass off with the one-third rule, uh, and San Augustine is two inches, and Bermuda is mowed at an inch and a half, you know, if you if you mowed every four days, it'd love it. But uh, absolute minimum would be once a week, uh, or you're you're into your one-third rule, and it stresses it stresses grass when you cut more than a third at a time off of it, especially once we get really hot. So it's even more important then. Bermuda at an inch and a half, that's tall for Bermuda. You know, I mean, I mean, you could do two inches, but the main thing is consistent and don't scalp it. But for Bermuda, inch and a half, that's, that's pretty tall. And St. Augustine, you know, two inches. I mean, you could do two and a half inches. You know, Bermuda, you could do two. St. Augustine, you could do two and a half, but you don't want to be, you know, changing it, you know, because if you if you go higher one time and lower the next or whatever, then you're probably going to violate the one third rule. And yeah, they are warm season grasses. Heat is is that's what they're adapted to. Um, they don't like the winter, the summer and the heat. That's that's their thing. If they have adequate moisture, and that was kind of the point of keeping them out of stress is keeping a stable moisture level. You know, if they get dry, they're going to be stressed. And of course, uh, pe some people will ask me about, well, uh, Bermuda gets by on less water, doesn't it? Well, now when you read things and they say drought tolerant, that's not referring to appearance. The difference between the amount of water for Bermuda and St. Augustine, if you want a nice appearance, not that great. When you read things that say Bermuda is very drought tolerant, that means if you don't water, it'll go brown and dormant, but it won't die. When the water shows up, boom, it's back. Now, St. Augustine doesn't have nearly that kind of tolerance. You know, if it gets real dry and stays there, it could go away. But Bermuda has underground stems. So it's kind of a survival technique that if it's too dry to cope, then they go dormant in the heat and they go brown. In the fall, when the rain or you start watering, they bounce back. That's what they're talking about. They're not talking about appearance. So, uh, yeah, and, and it's, it's pretty doggone hard to kill Bermuda once it's established. And, of course, now I'm going to mention uh, weeds. And the uh, primary thing to remember when you're applying different things, weed killers and such, it's assumed that the turf is well established. And, of course, when in doubt about weed killers, and we're always in doubt, if you're applying a killer, well, we're, there's some doubt there. So what's the remedy? You just got to break down and read the label because every item is different. And they'll tell you on the label when to use it, how to use it for it to be most effective. And you or I are not going to know that by buying the bag, you know. So and, and that's a deal where. When people tell you things, it's like, oh, I'm that's oh, that's interesting. Well, then you go home and you read the bag because that's the you know, it's it's uh, you don't want to do things contrary to the label because obviously the people that made it, they want you to be the most successful and they're going to tell you the best way to do it. Of course, timing is key. Uh, right now, you can you still got time to use uh, Dimension, which is a uh, pre emergent for grassy weeds primarily. It will inhibit and uh, prevent some broadleaf weeds, although a bunch of broadleaf weeds are already up and happening. Uh, this one, uh, crabgrass, you know, that, that's the type of thing that it's primarily uh, addressing. And of course, all pre emergents, when you apply them, you spread them and water them in pretty thoroughly, you know, about a half an inch to get it down to the soil and dissolve to where it makes a barrier because they don't, quote, prevent things from emerging. They kill them when they emerge. 
and that's the rule of thumb on weeds, as with everything in the world, the smaller and younger, the weaker it is, the easier it is to kill. So when a weed seed germinates, it's puny, and when it hits that barrier, that's when it kills it. So uh, you've got to be out in front. This one you could also apply in late April or early part of May for grass burrs, which are going to be happening in, in the summer. And here, uh, this one, you know, a lot of these bags uh, say covers up to, well, this one says covers up to, but here, if you read the label, we're in the south, so it doesn't, it doesn't get as high a coverage. This will cover about 3,500 square feet in the south. That's where we are. We also have uh, a weed beater, which is a pre and post emergent. And that one, one of the first things it says up here, you know, for best effect is you apply that at the second mowing, once the grass is up and going. And then that one, you wet the grass or the lawn first, apply it and leave it for a couple days before you water it in. It kills by being absorbed into the leaf of the weed. And then two days later, when you water it in, it'll kill by being absorbed by the root. And that's also uh, the thing that you can do now. Uh, you don't have to wait for the grass. You can do, well, with this guy, you might have to wait a little bit because it's a grassy weed killer in addition to a broadleaf weed killer. And uh, the grass may not be quite, grassy weeds may not quite be going on. And you can't use, if it says grassy weed killer in it, you can't use it on St. Augustine. Use it on Bermuda and, uh, uh, you know, that type of grass, but not St. Augustine. The weed out, which is a broadleaf weed killer, which you could do now, you can use it on Bermuda uh, and St. Augustine. Just a broadleaf weed killer. Won't bother grasses. And, of course, these two, it'll say on there, uh, don't mow a couple days before you do it, and don't mow until a couple days after you do it. And it's also one of those that uh, you're going to spray it specifically on the broadleaf weeds you have and leave it two days before you water it in. The same thing as a weed beater. It's absorbed through the foliage of the weed and then you water it in. And uh, a couple of days later, you can mow. And I told you when to fertilize. And now we'll get into a few things. Uh, what you're shooting for when you fertilize is you want to apply one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet. So we're going to, you didn't know there was going to be math in this, did you? Okay, well, we don't put out that warning because it cuts down in attendance when, when we say there's going to be math. Uh, but we've got a, uh, a 15, 5, 10 here. And the numbers there, 15, 5, 10, first number's nitrogen, second number's phosphorus, and the last number's potassium. Nitrogen's the one that you need to pay the most attention to, and that's 15%. So our math is, here we go. It's a 40-pound bag times, uh, let's see, 15%. So that's 0.15, and that's 6. So there's 6 pounds of nitrogen in there. So that would go 6,000 square feet. So if you... Uh, if you go ahead and divide 40 by 6, you get 6 and 2 thirds pounds. So you put 6 and 2 thirds pounds of fertilizer down, you've just put 1 pound of nitrogen. So that gives you a, you know, a ballpark of where you're at. But that's typically a, a rule of thumb. A pound of nitrogen, nitrogen per thousand square feet, that's a good feed. And then uh, water it in. Always do that. Don't water before. In this case, when you're fertilizing, don't water before. You water well afterwards to get it down to the soil level, off the foliage, and getting it dissolved to uh, penetrate the soil. And let's see. And then, of course, we've got a organic, and that's a 532. The numbers are smaller because it's not synthetic. Uh, and that one, uh, a bag like that, will do. Uh, you could say like a, a kind of heavy feeding that won't hurt anything, but would be 2,000 square feet. A lighter feeding would be 4,000 square feet, um, but it wouldn't hurt to do since it's a smaller percentage. But the key thing that, that um, organics do is 
you're building your soil. We need all the microbes we can get on our side. And there's microbes in there and the materials in there also uh, enhance the microbial activity in the soil. Well, if it says it on the bag, any direction that you see, especially on a synthetic, typically organics, that they're, they say, some of them say 4,000 square feet. That, that's okay, that's not a heavy feeding. You could go as much as the bag on 2,000. But if you're reading it on a synthetic bag, when it says it covers 6,000 square feet, or it covers 4,000 square feet, if it says four, that means there's four pounds of nitrogen in there. If it says it covers 6,000 square feet, that means there's six pounds of nitrogen in there. It always is, on synthetics, it's always talking about putting a pound per thousand square feet, and that's how they arrive at how much it'll cover. Uh, and of course, here, uh, winterizer, we're a ways from that, but that'd be your September uh, feeding, and that's a 10 0 14. Doesn't contain any phosphorus, contains 10% nitrogen and 14% uh, potassium. Potassium is, uh, um, enhances uh, the uh, winter hardiness of the grass. That's why that's where it is. And typically our soil around here has a lot of phosphorus, so that's not a, a big deal. Nitrogen is the most important thing. And then this is a, a new lawn fertilizer, and it's a 9137. So a little more phosphorus in there just to assist in root development. And then after it's past the new stage, you're not using this anymore. The nitrogen becomes the primary importance. And, let's see. and of course, here, bug problems. You know, we've got a couple of things. You know, this grub killer, you know, it does fire ants, grubs, uh, chinch bugs, sod web worms. Um, so that will take care of them. And no, if you have mold, that can be several things contributing to it. Uh, it could be that mostly crops up when you're in a partial sun area. You know, trees are affecting it and it's staying pretty moist. Or it could be that uh, the soil is really compacted and you're not getting water penetration. You know, it's kind of standing close to the surface. Uh, so typically mold is not a, you know, that may mean, like I say, the trees are growing and the grass is receding. All the grasses are sun plants. You know, all day, eight hours for a Bermuda is eight hours or more. It really is not shade tolerant. Bermuda is not. St. Augustine is probably the most shade tolerant and it would be best with six hours. It may hang on the ragged edge at four hours, but um, grass is a sun item and uh, if you're in a situation where the trees are taken over, then you have to choose trees or turf. And if you want to keep the trees, you may be into a ground cover thing. And uh, you can do English ivy, uh, which loves shade and hates scalding sun, um, uh, liriope or uh, monkey or mondo grass, or you can do uh, uh, vinca major, which is an evergreen ground cover. It gets kind of this tall and it'll take hold. It's winter hardy and uh, loves the shade. Uh, but, you know, there comes a point where if the tree keeps growing or whatever, you're, you're out of the grass business. Or you can do a mulch, you know, hardwood mulch, gravel, whatever. But if you're out of the grass business, um, decide on the tree or grass. And if it's the tree stays, well, then uh, give up on the grass. If it's because it's not really going to fill in under trees. It's that's not its that's not its niche. So. There's a question on here. Will any of the weed out or weed killer products kill flowers or for trees? Yes. As I say, read the label. Uh, they'll definitely kill flowers and herbs. Just all the all the herbs. They're broadleaf weeds. They're not grasses. They're broadleaf weeds and the flowers for that matter. So uh, that's where if you have flower bed issues, uh, uh, dimension is labeled for use in flower beds, you know, pre-emergent. You know, it's always prevention is better than killing them afterwards and uh, uh, much safer. And of course, while we're talking about killing weeds, 
Um, I mentioned it earlier, that's how pre-emergence work. So when that little guy, that seed, little seed busts open, he sends up this tiny little thing and it hits that and it goes, and he's done. Well, if a weed gets big and robust, it's flamethrower time. You know, you're past weed killers. Once they're big honking weed, uh, you're gonna have to remove it. A weed killer is, if you, if you pour the bottle undiluted, don't do that, it wouldn't kill it. I mean, once they're big and robust, uh, you know, these things, you know, everything is addressed to deal with it when it's vulnerable. You don't deal with it when it's, you know, just macho. It, it, that's too late. But, um, but to uh, reiterate, the best weed preventer is vigorous turf, water, fertilize, and mow. You can't overdo mowing. Be consistent and adjust your water according to the time of year. Do it early morning. And and now some people say, well, I take care of that water issue. I water every day. Well, that's a problem because if you water very much every day, well, you're stressing the grass instead of enhancing it. And if you say, well, since I'm watering every day, I don't water that much. Well, then what you're doing is the water never penetrates very far. And I've had people come in and, and I say, you're watering too often. And they say, well, if I don't water every day, the grass, it wilts. Well, that's because it's got a root system that deep because it waters every day. And the only part of the soil that ever gets wet is that top, you know, maybe an inch, probably not that. So you're cultivating a dependency. What you want to do is you want that, that water going down four to six inches. And watering every day, you just can't do that. So typically... Uh, when you're, when you're doing your water regimen, um, probably best if you're doing it once a week on that day, you do it early in the morning, whatever, you know, half an inch. And you can do as much as two inches like July, August when it's an inferno, but you do it early. And you, I mean, you might do it three times, but the thing is, if you water, wait a while, water some more, wait a while, water some more, and then that's it. You fill the tank, so to speak. You've gotten that water to penetrate, and the the idea that that person that's watering every day has in their mind is, if I'm not watering, it's not getting a drink. Well, if you've if you've watered on one day, two or three times to get it to penetrate, you filled up the tank. That soil is moist to a significant depth, and the water is there. It doesn't have to be watered that day to get a drink. You put it in the bank. There's a bunch of water out there. And if you're watering it like that, you get a deep root system. The root system can tap it, so it's good to go. So that's the way you want to shoot for. Yes, and now this is not a this is not a routine part of lawn maintenance, but aerating the soil is something that could be required, and it can be one of the things, like you mentioned, with like I said, with mold or things like that, that the the moisture is not penetrating. Uh, if you do aeration, uh, it can be, you can rent different things. Some of them pull plugs and others just poke holes, but you're just uh, getting an opening to a penetration of water and fertilizer and air. And I saw a demonstration of this that I did by accident years ago. I cultivated some Bermuda thinking I was going to do a bed. Then I didn't do it. And then I was out there. It's at the back of my yard and I'm looking at it in you know, like 10 days, two weeks later. And all of a sudden, this anemic, puny-looking uh, Bermuda that I cared nothing about, all of a sudden, it's green and coming on gangbusters. I didn't fertilize it, and I didn't wa I don't think I watered it. And all of a sudden, all I did was aerate the soil, and it's jumping up. So, And it was an area that probably never been cultivated. So aeration, uh, I, like I say, it's not a routine thing that you do. But if you suspect that your soil is extremely compacted, it, it would be a worthwhile thing. And then do that and um, probably best if the, uh, the turf is active when you do it. And that would be, if you're gonna do it, it'd be a good thing to do that before you're, while the grass is active and you're coming up, you're gonna fertilize, aerate it, fertilize it, water it, boom. It's gonna be coming on. Well, there you go. Well, how long, we're back to the tuna cans, and 
you know, you time your system at 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever it is, you got your cans out there spread around, you time it so you know, you measure things. If you don't measure things, you don't know. It's a hunch, and hunches don't get us very far. So you get your stopwatch, and somebody's timing it, and somebody turns on the sprinklers. You do 15 minutes. You look at all your cans and see what kind of water that puts down. Uh, and, and, of course, to know how deep, well, you get a trowel, you know, investigate. But, uh, and, of course, like I say, if, if, the turf, you see, you think, well, I'm watering pretty adequately and I'm fertilizing and it just doesn't seem to be happening. That could be a compactation thing that, you know, if, if the fertilizer can't get down and the water and the air can't get down there, uh, it tends to run off or just stay at the top. So, uh, uh, measure your watering system and you're gonna, the key to getting it to go down is that's your water till runoff and stop before that. And then you give it an hour or two, and then you hit it again. And that's how you're going to get it to go deep. 